Good morning. Welcome. It got so quiet in here. <laughs> well, my name is Terry Kimball. I'm president and CEO here at the Chandler Chamber, and I am really excited um, to bring you today's program. Our diversity, equity, and inclusion group, um, obviously with um, this month being um, Women's Month, they really wanted to showcase some strong leaders and diverse leaders within our community. And we're gonna to get to hear from their stories here in just a few moments. I also wanna welcome everybody online as well as I think um, Dr. Crawford, who is one of our co-chairs for this committee is joining us online today. Um, so thank you for being with us. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we'll be hearing from this distinguished group of individuals that are really, that are familiar with blazing trails and also breaking biases. And I love each one of their stories because it's very, very unique. And I really want you to gain insight from what these women have done. And again, I wanna do a huge shout out. And I know Dr. Banton's here from our Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. And I just wanna thank you that committee for their leadership in this program. I'd also like to do a shout out as well as Kate um, Ford. With um, our sponsors, we have PayPal, Toyota Financial Services, Intel, Edward Jones, Terry McKibben, and Salt River Project, as well as Wells Fargo. So thank them for their investment in continuing to move these efforts forward. So let's go ahead and get started with this to all-star panel of individuals that have been instrumental in breaking the bias. Views and insights from the panel is based on our speakers' views and not their company views. And before we dive into our panel discussion, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's event. Natasha Chapara is the Chief of Staff and Director of Edge Edu Execution Office at the Internet of Things Group for the Internet portfolio engineering team at Intel, as well as a member of the Chandler Chambers Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. She is responsible for 600 plus strong global organizations, delivering and growing a $4 billion plus product portfolio with an annual product operating budget of 20, 250 million. In addition, as director of Edge, 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 Edge Execution Office. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> Holy cow. She is focused on oper operationally execution and responsible for incubating new engineering business opportunities by identifying emerging, emerging trends within the Internet of Things and Network Edge businesses at Intel. Natasha influences global senior functional technical and business leaders and is a strategic advisor for executives on organizational transformation, product execution, and technology incubation. She is a fierce champion of inclusion and champions of diversity and inclusion for her global 2,300 people organization. That's a lot to oversee. She has a proud yellow jacket um, who has earned her bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology and is currently pursuing her executive MBA from Harvard Business School. As an industry evangelist for Intel, she has shared the Intel and customer joint successes and leadership talks on inclusion at over 50 plus global industry events and Intel inter internal conferences. She is passionate about creating a collaborative culture to build and drive high performing teams that meet and exceed customer expectations. Serving their communities is a fierce champion for women and the underrepresented minorities in technology. She is a self-described adventurous who loves exploring the world with her husband and two young boys. So put your hands together and please help her. But you know what? She needs, we need to acknowledge her efforts in, in being thank such you. a trailblazer. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we all have imposter syndrome now. Thank you uh, so much for the introduction. And, and it's really uh, extremely exciting to be moderating this amazing panel. In being in a room, I've done so many talks over the last couple of years where I was behind a screen, so not having my flip, you know, my fluffy um, 
bloody flip flops and just throwing them out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for for bearing with me. Um, I think a, a quick note about logistics, we are streaming online and um, you know we have some questions prepared, but we'll do our, our panel and our talk and then there'll be time at the end, actually plenty of time if we have close to 20 minutes for, for Q&A. So we look forward to the questions in the room and also the questions uh, from on, online. So without further delay, let me get us started by introducing this fantastic panel of uh, trailblazers and diverse leaders in our community. Our first panelist is Trina Patterson, who's the Senior Manager of Communications for the Launch Vehicles Business Unit in Northrop Grumman's Space System Sectors Launch and Missile Defense System Division. Trina is responsible for operations, financials, and strategic related communications for the business unit. This entails media relations, crisis response, executive and employee communication, employee engagement events and resource groups, community relations, social media, digital and graphic design, multimedia, as well as overseeing all communication operations for launches, supporting both the functional operations and programs. Trina began her career with Northrop Grumman in 2006 with the Propulsion System Business Unit in Utah. Prior to joining Northrop Grumman, she held communication positions with x Communications, the Space Dynamics Lab, and NASA's Space Grant Consortium. Her expertise in crisis communications was gained while supporting communication response to the Columbia incident, as well as two other catastrophic launch failures through operation resumptions during her career. Welcome to the team. <clears throat> Our second panelist, Julia Picciotto Peters, is the founder and co owner of my favorite coffee shop in Chandler, <laughs> Picciotto Coffee, a unique crop to cup roaster and shop located in downtown Chandler. Julia was born and raised in a coffee farming family in Brazil. She's an immigrant who came to the US to pursue a master's degree and career in corporate law. She worked for a large German company for 13 years before she had what was called an awakening moment which made her realize that it was upon her to keep her family's legacy in coffee farming alive while making it better for coffee farmers to trade coffee fairly and sustainably. She started Picciotto Coffee in 2015, importing, roasting, and serving coffees directly, transparently, and sustainably from her own family's home. <coughs> she grew a successful retail and wholesale business, which today is a reference for a sustainability and equitable business model. She runs a diverse and unique group of employees and is getting ready to grow her company to its second retail location in Billboard. Welcome. Thank you. Saving the best for the last. <laughs> <laughs> Our final panelist is Battalion Chief Susie Vargo with the Chandler Fire Department. Susie's desire to impact lives on a personal level led her to the fire service in 2002 after spending several years in private industry. During her tenure with the department, she has taken advantage of opportunities to play an increasing role. In May of 2005, she earned her pandemic certification and was subsequently deployed to assist with aid for victims of Hurricane Katrina based in Jackson, Mississippi. She was promoted to engineer in 2006 and captain in 2010. In 2013, she moved into a staff position responsible for the development and administration of multiple new nationally recognized EMS programs. She was promoted to battalion chief assigned to the emergency management division in 2006, uh, 2016. Serving as the emergency management coordinator for the city and Chandler's fire liaison officer with Homeland Security, she is an active liaison targeting multi-jurisdictional preparation, collaboration and response as well as a preparation at the local community, county, state, and national levels. She represented the city of Chandler and the fire department, partnering with Maricopa Public Health and Dignity Health to plan, coordinate, and operate the countywide pod services in the East Valley. Welcome. That is quite a list of accomplishments <laughs> on this table. <laughs> I hope uh, you know I can show that according to my two young boys, they're always fascinated by accomplished women. So this is definitely one. Great to be on the panel with you both, uh, with all three of you. So let's jump um, into the conversation. You know, I wanted to, um, and, and for the panel, uh, for the panel and the, the audience, 
we'll talk about things like journey and you know biases and learning from from mistakes and failures and resilience. Um, but let me get us started with our journey, um, uh, you know, discussion. There is so much data. I was uh, looking at this a few years ago, and it was fascinating that one of the most highly um, Googled term or highly searched term was first woman. And I think this is around 2018, you know, 2019 timeframe. And these were first like, you know, who's the first woman to run for office? The first one, woman to, you know, fly a plane? First woman to be, you know, Fire Chief Marshal. So it's like exciting that there is this, you know, renewed sense of wanting to understand what what women in leadership look like, what trailblazers have really shaped, you know, our industry, and we stand on their shoulders. So many of them that will never get counted because they're they're what I call working behind the scenes. So I want to start it off with as trailblazers of our community with these amazing backgrounds. Um, can you share your journeys and those aha moments that you think transformed who you are to become a trailblazer that you are today? Do you want me to start first? Sure. Start first? Sure. Um, so when I went, that was interesting that that was the Google term that was searched. So my first was I was the first in my family on both sides to go to college. So I was not just the first person but the first I guess woman I never thought of it like that um it was never something um talked about as I grew up it wasn't something that we did in our family we, we came from a, a very poor background so it wasn't anything that I ever imagined we were taught one way and this is what it was supposed to be you grow up you become a mom and and that kind of um future and I luckily got involved with sports um, started playing softball and had a lot of people helping me. My, my family actually wasn't that supportive. And at, for a long time, I really held that against my parents. Um, and, but playing sports, I was able to kind of learn about feedback. I was able to learn about being with a team and all these things that kind of help shape you as a person. And I realized that I have that power within myself to really do what I want and when I always kind of strive for that acceptance from my parents um I knew that if I could do it myself so getting straight A's was like my reward and my accomplishment so it was just that moment that I can do this uh fast forward to later on my mom um who I thought had never watched any of my games sorry <laughs> um she was watching my kids while I had gone and covered a launch and I'd come back from the launch and my she'd been taking my daughter to softball practice, which I found very ironic because she never did that for me, right? <laughs> um, so you have these like moments where you hold these things in for years and they just eat at you and eat at you and eat at you. And so we're at the house and she's like talking to my daughter Belle and I'm just kind of sitting there and she's like, you're such a good athlete. You remind me so much of your mom. And I was just like, kind of like, huh? <laughs> and she's like, she was so good at softball. She just loved it. She's like, we got to watch her a couple of times on the internet. And this whole time for these decades, I held that against her. And my mom was killed in a car accident a year later. So my big aha moment is, yes, we can trail the ways, but make sure as we're doing that, that we don't ever forget the people that brought us there. Mm -hmm. Oh. So, thank you. Uh, so, Natasha covered a little bit of my story, but uh, I do want to go back several years back and a, a lot of distance as well, because my, my story really began 5,600 miles from where we're sitting today. A lot of people ask me, how did you get started? How long did it take for you to get to where you are today? And my, my response is always, it has taken me 43 years, my whole life, to get to where I am today. Every step of the journey has built me for this moment of what I'm doing today, of what I'm living today. So like Natasha told you, I was born and raised in Brazil, in a coffee farming family, and I grew up watching my parents, my aunts, uncles, grandparents, everyone in my family <laughs> really give their lives to coffee, to farming coffee, a very difficult, temperamental product where one day 
you may have um, a lot of a lot of uh, product, and the next day you may lose everything because of weather conditions, because of ups and downs of the commodities market, because of of theft and other man-made uh, problems as well. So, so farmers are giving their lives for this product, but never really being fairly compensated for this agricultural product that they, they, they dedicate so much of their time, money, and energy to. So I grew up watching my family trade coffee in the commodities market, not really knowing why it was done that way, but with that feeling, that little sibling inside of me that told me that there had to be a better way for them to, to put their product, bring their product to the market and be paid equivalent to what their product is worth and, and all the work that they put in into the product. So for my parents, because of their experience, uh, and again, you know, going back to where we began, our roots and the people who got us to where we are today. For my parents, it was very important that we pursued professional education. They didn't want us to depend on the ups and downs of the coffee market like they did. So they pushed me, I'm the youngest of three women in my family, me and my older siblings to pursue our education. So I went to law school in Brazil when I was 22 years old. I packed my bags and I came to the U.S., by myself, I left my family and all that I knew behind. Um, I did a master's program at the U of A, or ASU grad. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're in an ASU. <laughs> um, and then I got my corporate job. And you know, throughout my journey, I heard many times like, if you if you can't do it's if you can't do this, it's okay. Like if you don't, if you go to the U.S. and it doesn't work out for you, it's okay to come back home. Or if you go to law school and you don't pass the bar because you're a foreigner, it's okay not to. Many Americans don't do that as well. So I always, you know, hearing those things, I always felt like, no, that I, I haven't a reason to, to go and to persist and to, you know, give my pass the first time I sit for the bar. So I sat for the bar and I passed. And then I became a lawyer here in the U.S. I, I, I worked as a as a senior legal director for 13 years, and I had this really successful life where everyone looking into my life. I married my husband, who's an, an aerospace engineer. He worked for 15 years for Northrop um, <laughs> and had two kids. So we had a good life. We didn't really have to change anything by all external definitions of success. We were, we were pretty successful, but the, my aha moment happened when my grandfather passed away and I came to realize that my father who was still in Brazil at that time, he was almost 70 years old, um, was the last one of his family still farming coffee. Everybody else had moved on to do other things or had lost everything because, you know, farming and sustaining coffee farming is really hard. So it hit me that I had to do something with my family's legacy. My oldest sisters were not involved in the, you know, in the coffee farming business. So I just, I took that upon myself to do something with it. I had no experience in, <laughs> in coffee, especially on the consumer side of thing. I was a coffee drinker, but not really involved in the industry. So, um, so we created, this idea came to me that I had to do something in my family's legacy, didn't know what it would be. So I started exploring the idea of uh, starting a business to keep my family's legacy alive, but not, not, not only uh, go that far, but make it better for farmers, create a better way for them to be able to sell the product in the market and people be adequately compensated for the product that they produce. So this idea of facial to coffee came to mind. And again, there was a lot of, a lot of, don't do that. Why would you risk your, your career? You invested so much, right? I had invested years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in education and other things to get to where I was. But I just felt this strong calling, the seedling, you know, bursting into life inside of me that, that told me that I had to go do something else. And, and keep my family's legacy alive. So being a woman in this journey, I believe was critical to getting me to where I am. A lot of people would say, you've made it despite the challenge, but I really feel like the challenges are 
exactly what propelled me forward. Correct. It's what feels to be where I am. So nowadays you have Richard Coffee, it's a successful business, has been from the beginning with a few setbacks, especially during COVID. Uh, but we do have a strong presence. I, have, I manage a very diverse group of individuals. We are the first woman-owned coffee, roastery, and retail business in the state of Arizona. We're certified by the WBNC uh, as a woman-owned organization. And we're building something that is really special and that it's recognized for being, you know, a very ec equitable business, a sustainable business. What is that? I have to say, my favorite uh, statement there was um, that you know you succeeded mm -hmm. not because of the hardships that come around being a woman, but because you're a woman. So mm -hmm. it's fascinating. Thank you for Absolutely. sharing that. Susie, would you like to add? Sure. Um, one of the very first questions you get when you test to become a firefighter is, what have you done to become a firefighter? And a lot of people go back to, well, I took my fire science classes, I did some ride along to the fire truck. But the real answer to that is that you've been preparing pretty much your whole life. So all of your life experiences, everything that you've been taught really has, has prepared you to, to go into this. Um, my, my parents lived in a very small rural town, born, raised and, um, in Kansas, and they didn't have much money. And my, I watched, and well, I didn't watch, but I learned that you know, my parents worked very hard to put themselves through college to um, where they didn't have family money to assist with that and where it really wasn't a priority for their family as well to move beyond the small town and, and, the, small in, and the small industry. And, you know, in my parents, both in separate ways, um, my dad put himself again through, through college a couple of years and then joined the Air Force and because he knew he couldn't afford it. So he was gonna use the Air Force experience to help pay for the college and it ended up being a 26 year first career for him. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and he really enjoyed it. And my parents got married shortly after he had gone through um, his officer candidate school the first couple of years. And she was the stay at home mom, always wanted to be home for her kids, you know, when they went to school, when they came home from school. And even if we just ran out of the house, she was going to be there for us. She became very involved in every military organization there was at the base. And her, she was very headstrong and she ended up usually running a lot of the programs. So I grew up knowing that my parents came from very little and they worked and beat a lot of odds to, to get to where they were. My dad ended up being a fighter pilot uh, with the Air Force. And after he retired, went to work on the Tomahawk cruise missile program um, through three different company reiterations, <laughs> so, you know, over time. And, you know, and then my mom also went to work after I uh, started college or started high school. So I watched them and they were always very supportive, got me involved in team sports. I grew up in a very, you know, military team environment, family environment. And, and what I always learned from them was that if I tried hard enough, I could do what I needed to do. I, I could succeed. I always, I never took no for an answer. It was always a matter of, well, how do I make the CS? Mm -hmm. And how do I go about it? Um, my, I didn't always want to be a fighter, you know, firefighter. Actually, I wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps. But at the time that I was of the right age, women well, couldn't be full parts of the squadron. They could be trainers. They could fly, you know, the, the larger cargo planes. And I was young and I said that, no, it's not really, I don't want to do that. So I'll figure out something else. And, and I went and worked corporate. Well, by the time I had aged out of that um, opportunity of going in the military, the first female fighter pilot came out. So had I actually put forth my time, that was an aha moment for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was really not the smartest thing. I could have, it could have been me. You know, I don't want to always have a whole lot of could have been me moments. Um, so I went to work corporate. I went to college, kind of did the thing. I, first, I have two older brothers, so first child to go through college. My dad was the first one in his family to, to go to college and graduate. And so I kind of did what I thought was going to be expected of me. 
And then I went and worked corporate and I ended up being a product manager or marketing manager for a medical device company in San Diego. And it was a worldwide company, very exciting. I got to travel and I got to do all that. And then I had another aha moment when my, my grandfather passed away, which was the first time in my life that someone in my family passed away. And I started realizing that life was too short to be doing something that I wasn't all in on. And my parents, so I was 30, I think, around that. And my and I told my parents, and they thought I was having an early midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to switch careers, and I'm going to become a firefighter. So my brother had had that conversation with them several years earlier. And he had been working in Tempe, so I had gone and wrote with him and, and the job was completely different from what I thought it was. I figured we'd go fight fires. I had no idea. We had several different calls with, you know, medical calls. Yes, there were fire calls, but there, there was a whole lot of community and, and interaction with people and it, it was going and you were, you know, making a difference in, a, in someone's life. I knew the products that I was working on in corporate was making a difference, but I was having firsthand opportunity to, to, to make an impact. And so I moved out here, got hired on, and it was, a, it was an interesting process because 20 years ago, women are usually about three to six percent of the firefighter population. It's not very big. Um, and so when you get hired on as a female, you tend to be looked at more and you are, you are judged more and you are evaluated more, more frequently. And in, in I think in the beginning, I, I had a little bit of an issue with that, but I turned it around because the other aha moment was I can take advantage of this opportunity that everyone's looking at me because I can prove every day that I am just as good, if not better than many of you on this job. And so I took that, that opportunity and I was proficient and I excelled at, at everything that I was doing. So there was no doubt and that reputation does spread. So I took that opportunity and I think partly growing up in the Air Force, I moved 18 out of my first 16 years, kind of made me want to keep doing things. So it's probably why I went and got my paramedic as soon as I could, tested for engineer as soon as I could, tested for captain as soon as I could, um, and got involved in, in a lot of programs because I like the change and I like the opportunity to be able to have an impact in different areas. So then I decided that I wanted to test for battalion chief. And it was a, um, I was first female to test for battalion chief in our department. And I, I figured I had this great reputation. This was going to go really well. And that's when I got hit my first seal. And it was, um, it was interesting, and the conversations that I had had after after the process, um, that as well qualified as I was, there is a concern about promoting me as the first female because people would assume I was getting promoted because I was a female, and so that was a that was a struggle for me, and it was a and I was pretty shocked. So, you know, so I kind of took that and said, well, I'm not going to let that happen again, and I'm going to keep going. I tested again. Unfortunately, it was a time that my mom had she had been fighting a two and a half or a year and a half of pancreatic cancer. She had passed away. So the next opportunity I didn't do so well because my mind was there. But the third time I went for the Italian chief, I nailed it. And I took everything I had and I went all in. So I've been a battalion chief for almost six years now. And the, the, the one thing about being out there and knowing that people know who I am and know my skill level is that they also know my previous work history. So throughout the last, well, at least eight years, 10 years, if they want a program created, they come to me because I did business plans. I ran basically small businesses. So I'll create programs. We did a treat refer program. That's where we can go out and treat someone on, for different things and, and uh, and be able to leave them there instead of transporting them. That got into, we piloted that and that got adopted by Arizona Department of Health Services. So for everyone in Arizona now, we were, we were pioneering that. That was my program. Um, we did community paramedicine. We did, I, I had an opportunity to be involved in many new things. And then that continued as when I got promoted a battalion chief 
and going into emergency management. Emergency management is one of three hats that I wear. And I joke because it's there's a lot to emergency management, meaning it can be as big as you want. You're connecting with so on so many different levels. And and when I joke that, you know, in my spare time, I'm also our safety officer, that's our risk manager for our department. <laughs> and I'm also our accreditation manager, which is an international, you know, compliance accreditation process that that we do, showing that we meet standards on all of our policies and procedures. So there were several aha moments that, I, like I said, I don't like taking no for an answer. I like, I, it's, and, and I don't like hearing no from people. I, I want to know, how can I make the CS? And through those moments, they've kind of, you know, really molded me and, and moved my, my, my needle, you know, on, on where I wanted to be. And they've, it's afforded me, being a female has afforded me that opportunity when I've used it for, you know, to prove myself. You know, I know that people are looking at me, so I'm going to use that to prove myself and show you that I'm excellent at it. Fascinating journeys and so many themes that are overlapping of you know resilience and not taking those for an answer and representing you know not just yourself but so many women who look up to you. Amazing. Thank you for sharing this. And and I think I'll switch from um, you know the journeys and the successes to getting to be the trailblazers uh, that we are and here to the yin yang, um, you know, failure. It's, it's like a, one of those things that everyone says, you must fail and learn to grow from failure. And then when you sit down with someone and talk about failure, it really does uh, you know, hit a nerve because we're all a little bit cautious about acknowledging our failures and, and knowing what failure looks like and especially talking about it. I, I personally think that uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, support for women today in leadership roles, you know, in businesses and communities and, and corporations, but is this fear of failure that really holds us you know, back as, as leaders, as, as women leaders. And um, to me, failure is all about failing fast. I'm, I'm okay with failure, but I wanna fail quickly and, and you know, bounce back. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> so, so fail fast, you know, fail with, with confidence and then take some accountability of, of the failure that you went through because it becomes that natural stepping stone. And it's not something that comes, you know, with your first failure. I think you just go through so many of them that you're like, oh, I get it now. I see why it's a stepping stone, you know, I'm gonna let this sink in. So as you know, as you talked about your journeys and some of the the um, support you had with your with your families and, and your communities, can you share a failure that could have really you know set you set you backwards or you could have taken as a pause? I heard so many of them in, in your stories, but can you share one that really resonates with you? And what did you learn from that failure? <laughs> so, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is what is failure, right? Because I feel like everything is relative. It's really a matter of perception, right? I mean, you can, you can be on your journey and encounter this challenge and then, you know, uh, other people will label those obstacles as failures. But to me, of course, I've had several adversities throughout my journey, but I think that the key thing is like looking at the so um, quote unquote called failures and seeing them as lessons, right? And seeing them as opportunities. I think that that has been the biggest theme throughout, you know, my personal journey in overcoming failure has been, I don't really see failure, I see, I see lessons, you know, that need to be unpacked and and be worked around or or you know taken and then applied later on in a in a different context. So i you know when when I gave up on my corporate job and a career that was very cushy, was very stable for me and my family. I had toddlers at the time. I had I had great perks that came with my job of having benefits and insurance and I left everything behind to go 
to jump into the unknown, a lot of people looking from the outside would see that as, as a failure. Why did you fail in your on your on your career? Why did you fail on your, you know, on, on this journey that you dedicated so much time and energy? And you're risking your family now to 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 take on this new business venture. So so to me, there is that angle of of being a failure. And I think as women, we internalize that. And of course, there's a fear of what if this doesn't work out? And, you know, that I'm a failure, that I am a, uh, I'm, I'm, I am a, a precedent for other women that will come after me for my children, for, for, for these younger women. But at the same time, there is, there's really no failure as long as you're willing to, to unpack the lessons that every journey that every experience brings to you. Uh, so that was one, a moment for me that I feel like others looking from the outside were probably, you know, could probably interpret as a failure. But for me, it was I needed to go through that process to birth something that perhaps, you know, is not perceived as, I mean, I'm a small business. I run very small numbers, nothing close to the billions and, and <laughs> Uh, thousands of employees like it was uh, introduced here for me it's a very small a very a very uh, small number small group of people that I manage but I feel like I we can have a huge impact in doing something so simple right so I, I work a lot more <laughs> than I did before so you know in some people from, from some perspectives that could be seen as failure in comparison to where it was before i make a lot less money than I did before. You know, I received a paycheck every two weeks. That was really nice. Now I have to, I have to create that paycheck every single day with my business. So again, that could be perceived as a failure, but I, I, I see it differently. I see this as a daily opportunity for me to impact my community. It's not just serving coffee. I'm impacting this whole supply chain from the farm all the way to the end consumers. I have very big goals, like when you look at our vision and our mission statement is to change lives through coffee. It's not just to serve a cup of coffee, it's to change lives along the way. So, so that vision is what keeps me seeing these adversities and obstacles as not as failures, but as opportunities for me to make an impact. Fantastic, great story, thank you. you know, I I, I like that as far as um, opportunities, because that's how I ended up looking at things. I know early on, you know, I, I had what I perceived as failures, and that's how I looked at them. And it was over the years that I realized that, no, those were adversities, those were challenges in my life, and those provided opportunities for growth for me. And if, and, you know, often in interviews, we get the question, do you have any regrets? You know, do you wish that you had done things differently? And well, yes, you know, there are times that were, that were struggles. I learned and I grew from those experiences and I was able to take them and, and not only talk to other people to help them through, but it, it helped me gain a greater perspective on, on what I needed to do and, and, and accomplish things. It's a, uh, um, Lessons learned is, is a, a big thing that I think that we can all use to take perspective of and not be necessarily so hard on ourselves, but, but use those as opportunities to, to make yourself better. And, and, and it makes you a very you know, well-rounded person, I think, to, to have those experiences to be able to relate to more people. Um, but, but yeah, there were definite times that I had challenges and but it, overall, I can't say that I regret any of them, you know, and that if you do, if you don't use it as an opportunity for a lesson, then, then that's kind of a problem. I had a, I had a CEO that I worked with very early on in my previous career, and his thing was don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. And so that left a huge impact on me, and that was a few decades ago. And... And, and so that's how I started looking at things that, I, okay, I had, this became a problem. How do I make a solution out of it? Or what are my little different options for it? So, so yeah, so looking at, looking at it as opportunities is kind of what's helped me through. Okay. 
Yeah, and the question when you said awesome failure, I was like writing a list. It was going to be really long. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm like, and that's just a, I, I, failures happen every day. And when you're feeling like you have to be perfect, then you're going to feel like you're having more failures. So you have to be okay when you trip up or you fail, you know, taking that accountability. I, I mean, I've made some mistakes that there was, so we had a spectacular, when we have a failure in launch, it's usually pretty spectacular. Um, <laughs> if it's with visible, right? Um, and we had one that had been terminated by the range after 19 seconds of flight. And you could see it unzipped, it was a solid rocket. So you could see it, it wasn't really explosive. Um, but I was standing by the camera that was live streaming. <laughs> And I cussed. <laughs> <laughs> I said, mother. <laughs> and um, it wasn't, um, we didn't have that BP power. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, it was me. Like when I played it back, I was like, and people that started recognizing the voice, are, you know, it was really, it was something I was like, I, I got to take that back. So those, those failures back then, I was mortified, right? It was this reaction that I realized I was standing next to the camera. I was like, Oh crap. And so, um, but then you learn from that. So, you know, you, I've been, I do the commentary play by play. And so there can be a chance I'm live on camera when we have something happen. And it's like, I've got to have my reaction and check, right? So it's something that you can always learn and grow from. But one of the biggest things with failures, and I love how you guys frame it, it is about framing it. As women, we're all afraid to fail. The imposter syndrome is really real. We're probably mm -hmm. comparing each other right now, and we've got to stop <laughs> doing that. Um, I was playing softball, and I missed a pop up. Um, I was catcher, and I was very competitive, very competitive. But I missed it, and I felt like I just failed the whole team. It was a, it was a game we really wanted to to make, and you feel that pressure of your teammates and. We're walking into the dugout and the pitcher put her arm around me and said, you'll get it next time. I think I was 14. That meant more than anything in my life. You'll get it next time. So when you see failures of those around you too, instead of like, haha, or which sometimes we tend to do, let's be honest, be the one that picks that person up and helps them. It can totally change your life. That was very, very good. Cool. And great way to say it. I, I think I'm inspired to share this that I think if you're not failing, you're not, you're not taking you're risks. Really. You're just comfortable. <laughs> and so force yourself to fail because that'll tell you you're taking risks, you're putting yourselves out there, and you're uncomfortable. This is something I tell my team all the time. So if they're listening, they'll probably have a good chuckle at this one. Then get comfortable with the uncomfortable. That is your path to growth. And, you know, learn to fail and really take the risk. Otherwise, you're just in a really comfy spot. And we've all been, it looks like, in really comfortable spots. And then we decided, no, let's shake things up. This is, um, you know, this can be done better or I can be better. So I, I love that story. And, and to your point, Trina, you know, if you see someone struggling, you know, share a story. I, I usually pull up a chair and I'm like, how much time do you have? I have really cool things to tell you about how miserably I failed. In <laughs> and just sharing that story makes people just feel good. You know, they're like, ah, it's just like a small roadblock as compared to the blunders Natasha's committed in her life, you know? So you build that, especially for women, you build that, um, you know, partnership with each other, that support system, that village. And you don't just need that at home as we raise our families. And you also need it in your workplaces and in your communities. So great call out. Thank you for, for sharing. Um, let me let me uh, dig into my next question of confidence. No shortage of that on, on this panel. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to share some numbers that were sort of interesting. I think we've probably all heard of these numbers that, you know, uh, men apply for jobs when they meet only 60% of the qualifications. Sorry. <laughs> but women apply only if they meet 100% of the qualifications. So what does this mean? It just means that Men are confident uh, even at 60% of their abilities. And we look for that checklist and say, do I have each and every one down? And you know, what does that mean? Um, and to me, really, what this means is like, we just gotta have more faith in ourselves and our abilities and, you know, stop making checklists, like trust your gut more, dig into areas that you think, I think I can do this. And again, it goes back to the risk. Worst case, you'll fail and you'll be back at your very cushiony job you know, as a lawyer, and then the rest of us will be struggling for, you know, perfect cup of coffee. 
uh, <laughs> that we won't be able to get. So can you share any examples where you think, um, you know, you've considered capability and the list and said, perhaps I'm not the one for it. You know, I don't have all the insights and the knowledge. And I wanted to share it in a way that somebody who's listening to us today in this room and, and uh, you know, live audience can, can say, hey, I don't, it's a great example. I only need to know 60% and I think I'm good to go, go take my next, you know, big risk. I am. Um... When I first tested for, uh, and we do promotional processes, so we call it testing. So when I first went through the testing process for, for Battalion Chief, I had been on the department for, gosh, I was trying to figure this out, 12 or 13 years. And I've been captain for, I believe, you know, three years. And, and there was a perspective out there on what you must have in order to be able to be successful in this position. And most everyone that was there before me had at least been on the fire department for, you know, much longer, you know, or, or in the captain position much longer than I've been. And so I faced a, well, you're not really qualified for this. And because you haven't been here long enough and you don't know enough about this. And, and it was, it was hard not to get sucked into that because it was, well, you're, you're right. I, I haven't been on a fire truck as long as you have. But I'll tell you that my role as a division chief, as program managers, though, as people managers, I had that experience for 12 years before I came on the fire department, yet people were looking very specifically at the time that I was in this particular industry. And so it was much of a, a selling thing for me to, to go, well, no, um, I'm actually very well qualified for this position. In fact, I have more experience at some of this stuff than any. And, but it, but it was easy to get kind of sucked into that as far as, well, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe I don't have all the qualifications. You're right. I haven't been here as long as you guys. You know, you're right. I haven't, you know, been in this particular position. Um, so maybe it's not enough. And it made me start doubting myself until I started really taking a step back and looking at the larger picture and realizing that, you know, yeah, I, I, I have well, well beyond this. I can, you know, I can learn that. Anyone can learn this part of it. And I have the skill and the ability to learn it. And I'm so much more, more well-rounded in the grand scheme of things compared to everyone else. And, and so just hitting my 20 years, that was kind of the thing that we, that we do. You know, hit your 20 years, so now you're eligible to and retire or, or do something different. And to, not that I'm looking to retire or look at anything different, but <laughs> I started looking, I started getting all these things from LinkedIn and ZipRecruiter and, and all that. And there were a lot of positions that it's funny because I started looking at them and I'm looking at the preferred qualifications and minimum qualifications and everything. And, and there's some that I just kind of wrote off because, well, now I don't have those. You know, like I, I don't have the whole thing. I, I could probably learn it, but I don't have it, you know. And to get into that mindset of, well, oh, I can nail that one because I have all of that. So it's it's funny that even over time and going through what I've gone through, I still have that in the back of my head of, well, you know, I need to do the whole thing. It's, you know, that. So it's, it's a challenge. I mean, example. <laughs> Just going through my list, exactly right. what we do. You know, mm -hmm. you talk yourself out of it yeah. because you don't have them. Right. And and just a reminder that you don't need everything on the list. It's just a hard one. It is. You yes. just have to remind yourself you know, on a constant basis. On it. And Trina, any any thoughts for me on that? Yeah. So I was thinking about this. There's a few things. But when I went to college, um, again, never been pushed for education. I my dad was a private pilot. Um, when he was younger and then he didn't keep his license, but he loved everything airplanes. And so he would always be showing us airplanes in the sky and all this stuff. And so I took an engineering class just for the fun of it in aerospace engineering. I honestly don't know what it was. I just saw the aerospace. Um, but I, so I ended up getting my minor in engineering. So, um, but I loved it, but I wouldn't change my major because I was a woman. And my brain told me that women can't do that. And like everything I've learned has told me that they can't do that. And I had this professor, he was he was so ancient, like literally ancient. And he he was such a women's advocate. And he 
he kept saying, why don't you do this? And I'm just like, no, I'm good. I'm going to do communications. I literally got a BS in communications, which I think is hilarious. Um, but he, it was about my senior year. And he said, hey, I know I can't switch you over to engineering, but I have, and I honestly thought I was going to go to career of like sports type stuff. He said, there's this opportunity with this thing called NASA, this place called NASA, and I can put in a good word if you want to apply. And I was just like, huh, okay, yeah, go ahead. So literally two weeks later, I'm standing at the base of the space shuttle, um, <laughs> looking up. And I got to do an engineering walk down. So started at the top by the beanie cam, put it at 84 feet in the sky and walked down the steps and looked in the clean room, looked where they put the astronauts. I've been in the shuttle, I've been in the orbiter, um, supported 21 shuttle missions later. And I still look back to that time where I was like, I can't do that. And, and now it's like, can you imagine if I would have said no, you know, and it was, it was interesting going from athletes to rocket scientists. It's like, can we make you sound a little smarter? And I have no idea what you just said. Um, so it was, it was a, a huge change in the industry, but it's like been just so amazing. And the biggest thing is that my dad is so proud to like watch what I've become. And he watches all the launches and he, he, it's just incredible. He has dementia now, and I'm the only child he remembers. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> not a competitive thing. <laughs> so it, it really is like those voices in your head. It, it's almost like you need to put a name to it and tell her to shut up. <laughs> like Gertrude, shut up. I don't believe you, and start telling yourself that you can. And I think it can make all the difference. It's hard. It's a hard. It's hard, but that's great. It's a great story. Yes. To, to saying yes to opportunities, right? Yeah. When you think seeing where it would it go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can hear a common theme here of being your biggest advocate, right? Because there are a lot of times we hear no from the outside world, but having that self motivation, self validation, right? A lot of times you look for validation elsewhere and not within. And I think for me, it has played out in my life in different ways. One was you know, when I was taking the bar exam and, you know, a lot of people tell like, oh, but, you know, it's okay if you don't pass, you know, many Americans don't do it the first time. And, you know, I hadn't gone to law school in the U.S. There are only two states that accepted uh, foreign nationals to sit for the bar exam. It was California and New York, which happened to be the hardest mm -hmm. in the country as well. So I... I think that, you know, I learned that early in my life that I had, I was on my own here in this country. I had to be my biggest advocate. I had no one else to do it for me. So I just put in my mind that, no, other people do this. I can do this as well. And I just went for it. And then when I made the switch into coffee, I had no experience whatsoever in running a business, in starting a business, in, in being in the food and beverage industry, which comes with its own unique set of challenges on a daily basis that I just told myself that I can learn this. I can learn anything if I, if I want to. So just being in that perpetual state of supporting yourself and validating yourself, but also knowing that you can learn anything. So even if it's a new chapter, a new a new challenge, you can go and you study and you research and do your, your due diligence and you can, you know, become the expert, not with 100% of knowledge, but perhaps with 60% like other people do. So just, just being your biggest advocate, I think it's a critical mindset shift that it should happen. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that with us. Advocacy for yourself, and I think it leads me to our next question. And uh, Molly, you can keep us honest on time and tell me when I have to wrap it up. Um, advocacy for yourself is great. What I'll tell you is that I noticed that having allies in the room, whichever virtual or physical room you're in, is like one of the biggest pluses um, that has helped me be where I am. And then I think from our stories, it looks like, you know, we are all avid champions or of ourselves we know how to push through and move forward but having that support system sometimes you know you don't have it and you don't have that allyship and you notice when you get wow i've been missing this this in, entire time and and you know allyship is when men 
you know, use their influence, their voice, um, you know, their, their power, their words to support women. And there's so much data that talks about when men speak up for women, that they're more likely to be taken seriously by other men. I mean, let me say this again, because when I read it, it just blew my mind off, that when men speak up on behalf of other women, they're more likely to be taken seriously by other men. <laughs> and um, I, we have a friend here who is wearing this shirt that says women belong in, uh, in, in places where decisions are being made. It's one of my, my favorite quotes. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you think about allyship and your, your own, you know, advocacy and uh, what it means to grow and, and support yourself and those around you, because we also act as allies to other women. You know, can you talk about um, your experiences and share some thoughts of what can men do to be better allies for women? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. So one thing I wanted to start off with is um, we always talk about gender biases, and I know that it is an uncomfortable topic, and sometimes it actually shuts people down, um, especially men. Like, you start coming across, and there's stereotypes that go along with being a feminist, and so you start bringing that up, and, and you can kind of lose the audience. In um, aerospace, I'm often one of the only women in the room. On the last launch that we did in February, I get a a uh, um, text from my sister and she's screenshotting me on camera she can see me in the control room she's like you're you're in the control room with everybody in suits and I'm like yeah she's like are you the only woman I'm like no and I turn and look and I am <laughs> and I'm the only one with hair in the first two rows it was like <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like yes you're right I, I guess I am that's surprising and shameful for us, right? Because I know there's other women there just in different rooms. But so to be able to remember who your audience is, and when you have those opportunities where we've all heard men explaining, for those that don't know, it's when a woman says something and the man repeats it as their idea. And it so instead of getting upset and, and having that kind of become like a fire for you to be able to coach and, and kind of raise that opportunity. But my favorite allyship of that work at at Northrop Grumman, they have a big focus on DEI, and and they send executives to go do like a week long um, uh, training and leadership training. And we had one, our director of engineering, and I asked him if I could talk about him yesterday. So I'm like, I'm gonna talk about you. So he went for this week long training, no big deal, comes back and in staff, he says, I'm gonna have a conversation. This is gonna be very uncomfortable. And I was like, oh, what's this? <laughs> and he starts talking about the things that they do that they may not see. And I'm saying, yeah, 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 right? This is amazing to hear. And you could feel that uncomfortable level in the room. But he was very much stepping up for it. He attends all of the professional women's group meetings. He's a huge advocate now. He came in my office a week later and he said, I have a crazy question for you. And he was talking about privilege and all of this. He's like, When's the last time you feel feared for your life? I was like, hmm, probably like last week at Walmart. There was a really dark parking lot. And he's just shaking his head. So in this training, that was a question they asked the room. They said, if you feared for your life in the last year, raise your hand. And all the women raised their hand. And all the people of color raised their hand. And he was like, what? You know? And then they said, last six months, hands are still, two, you know, two weeks, hands are still raised. And then they went and, and had everybody talk about it. And he told me, he said, I had no idea. I went and talked to my wife. I had no idea that she was afraid. Like when she's walking out at night alone, I did not know that. I didn't know that a, a black person was afraid every time that they got pulled over and, and why and all those experiences. And it just opened it up. And so that was probably like a year ago. Just recently, we were working late. It was like almost 7.38, and he stops by. He goes, are you done yet? I'm like, almost. He's like, okay, let me know. I'll walk you to the park. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, to me, that meant so much, not because I needed someone to walk me in the car, but because he understood that, and he had that bias at one point that is gone, because now he's had that kind of invisibility that he didn't understand so when you see people that are maybe not behaving how you feel they should i would instead of giving it, it something that makes you mad look at it as an opportunity to help give them grace and help teach them to maybe do something better 
the allies are huge. So, men, thank you for signing up for us. Oh, and you know, it's a uh, gender bias. So, part of my thing of <laughs> being a female in department, I still have very, a lot of very chivalrous, chivalrous men that work with me. And early on, it was extremely important for me to show that I could do my job and I could do what everyone else was doing. And one of our assistant chiefs has a story about how he was my captain. He told, there was a, it was a it was a motorcycle on a car accident, and he had to move the motorcycle. And so, he, uh, um, I was supposed to go lift the motorcycle off the ground and, and move it, and he instinctively came over to try to assist me. And I, I gave him this look, and <laughs> I remember this look, and, and every day, and, and I was like, no, nope, I'm off, you know, my hands are off, you know, I, I, I understand, that was, that was my thing for you. And then there was another call where, um, when, as he was captain, there was another assistant chief that was with him, and there was someone that we had on the backboard, and, and I needed to help pick it up to, to move it to the ambulance. And the assistant chief was about to walk over to help me, and the captain's like, nope, don't want to do that. Stay back. <laughs> and so, you know, it was, it's, there's different ways about it. And, you know, but, and while it's become a, a story, it was, it was a time for me to, to be able to show that, okay, this, there are some skills here. I appreciate everything you do. You want to hold the door open for me? That's great. <laughs> you know, there, it, it, it's fine. I'm, I'm okay with it. But, but there are things about my job that you need to let me do. Um, that ended up translating into a point where after I was promoted, we had a, an emergency meeting with all of our senior staff, which means our battalion chiefs, assistant chief, and fire chief, because there was a, there was a problem with one of the females on the um, department. She was going through something. And we're trying to figure out, they were spitballing, throwing out things of what they could do to, you know, to help her. And I'm sitting there and, and maybe that was a moment I, the first time I had my, my voice in a, in a room full of men was that, hey, I, I said, you don't understand what it's like to be a woman on this department. And they looked at me and they're like, no, you're right, you don't. And it was that moment, I think, that me speaking up and, and making them recognize that, that, that we need to consider all the different ideas in the room, of all the different genders, all the different ethnicities, everything, in order to better match our very diverse group, not only within our department, but the community. And so there was a lot of, it, it, it's been a career 20 years of, of trying to open people's minds to, to what it's like and, and, and how women are a huge part of, of the management and the, the change and, and affecting good, good environments. So it's a, been, I don't know, some interesting experiences along that, along that line of trying to meet those biases. Yeah, so to me, the way bias has showed up on my path and that I have seen in action is usually because assumptions are being made, right? And people are not, are not communicating. So what I tell my team is that we need to stay curious. Right, we need to ask questions. I feel like a lot of bias can be eliminated and that's where men can help us in, in their allyship is in staying curious, right? Asking questions, how does this make you feel? Do you feel afraid? Raise your hand if, you, you know, if you've experienced this before. So just staying engaged in a, in a conversation versus, versus just being quick to assume and judge. So that's how I, I have been working with my organization and, you know, I work with a lot of younger people. I hire a lot of younger people and there's, you know, not just the bias towards women, there's bias towards minorities and LGBTQIA, you know, all the, the this uh, gender identity. So, so in order to help them feel safe in our environment, we work really hard to ask questions. I encourage all my leaders, don't give the answer, just ask more questions mm -hmm. until you fully understand what is at stake for this person in this situation. And then you can 
you can guide them or you can, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll tell you exactly what they need for you. Instead of you offering to do it for them, let them tell you what they need for you, what kind of support and allyship they need for you. That, that's great because I don't think there's, you know, there's not one answer that solves all problems or is applicable in, in all situations. Like my VP of engineering is, is brilliant. And he's also my VP of engineering, so he has to deal with me on a very regular basis. <laughs> and you know, he's he takes that similar approach as as you said, and hope he's he's listening into um, you know, how do I walk this fine line of being an ally, still not you know carrying that bias, uh, perhaps you know, and, and at the same time you know letting her lead and and grow in a space where that allows her to just be herself, because you know we are all very different individuals, so. You know, to the men who are considering allyship or what does it look like, I think the most important thing you can do is it's the same, you know, feel free to make mistakes. You know, if you said something that was with the right intention, don't wait for like an, you know, three day period, just go immediately after and say, I think I was trying to help, but I came across as mansplaining because I will do that to people. And I think your intention was to really give me, you know, some support, but instead you took my answer and restated the whole proposal and then the whole room rallied around it. So, you know, think about that. The, the other thing I would say is being a good ally makes good business sense, right? There's a support system that you're building in your team, but you're driving business results and outcomes, whether you're running coffee shops or, you know, you're leading communications teams or, you know, we're, we build products, you know, Susie's as, as the fire marshal. In all the expected business outcomes that you need, you need to find a way to make sure that allyship stays front and center because it'll be the bottom line of how your business succeeded, succeeds or why it doesn't succeed. So, you know, just keep that, that aspect in mind. So with that, I think we're at a place where we'll take, um, you know, we'll pause with the, with the questions and maybe take some questions from the audience here. And also, DJ, if you have any questions online for us. Yeah. Any questions in the room? Yes, sir. Uh, you all kind of touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to go down a little deeper. <clears throat> and that goes on uh, um, about balancing, you know, the duties and responsibilities of, say, motherhood, there's a new family, and a career. And also <laughs> contrasting, I want you to think about this, the duties of fatherhood in pursuing a career. Because traditionally, it's been fathers putting their career ahead of their fatherhood responsibilities and mothers putting their public responsibilities ahead of their career responsibilities. Now it seems to be changing, but both are equally important. In fact, the parental responsibility part is far more important than the career responsibility. So I think I want to run with it. Yeah, no, I, I love it because I think it's a big, it's actually one of my favorite topics, especially if I'm mm -hmm. talking to young girls, because here I have all these pictures with me in control room at our lunch, and, and I was a single mom most of the time. So it's like, oh my gosh, can you have a career and be a mom? The answer is absolutely. You can have a career and be a mom. You can have a career and be a dad. And just even if a dad puts their career first, they still should be a dad. And if you if you put your career first, you still have to be a mom. I think my biggest reward <coughs> is when my kids now at, in Utah at Weber State, but at the U of A too, and down the road. Um, when they were little, it wasn't, you know, <clears throat> talking about I'm going to grow up and get married or whatever. It was talking about going to college because they were watching this powerful mom. And I, I had one, I was in the middle of a launch. My daughter's calling me and um, we're about ready to go out to where we take everybody to see it. And I'm like, honey, oh, mom, you got to play back. I got to go launch Rocket. And <laughs> the, the reporters are like, can you imagine your it's mom amazing. saying that? So I've had, I've had women co-workers who've told me that they've had leaders who wouldn't send them on a launch campaign because of the fact they were a mom. Instead of just asking them, right? Give them that chance. Um, we really can multitask very well, but I, you can talk to my children too, but it's really having that focus on, yeah, I, I have this incredible career, like it's a blast totally, right? But I also can be an incredible mom. And some of the stuff I learn at work in my development classes, I'm thinking, oh, this could be really good for my kids too. So just as dads balance it, we do too. Um, even if you don't have a partner to do it with, you can still do it and be very successful. So being a parent 
is part of having a career, no matter what you are, whether you have kids or not, just being that person who's going to be that example for the next generation is something we all should carry on our shoulders. So I appreciate that question and being brave to ask it, right? So, so I really appreciate that question. Great, great question. Uh, do you want to add to it? Yeah, so I have a very involved husband. We share everything, including business and life to the 50-50 line because we have to, right? We're both fully busy, heavily involved in business. My husband, by the way, is our chief financial officer and operational officer for the business. He does, he does everything on the background that nobody else can or wants to do <laughs> in the business. So we share everything in parenting as well. Like this morning was an example. Normally I get my kids ready for school and, and uh, make them <coughs> breakfast, make them lunch, make them snacks and send them out the house this, this morning, my husband did that so that I could be here, right? So having a partnership in life, just like we have a partnership in business is really critical where we both feel valued. We both feel we contribute equally to parenting, to our kids' developments, but uh, it's a practice. Finding that balance is always a practice and never a destination. You never get to a point where you feel like, okay, now I've have perfected this parenting and work life balancing. There are some days you you swing to one side, other days you swing to the other one. And as a woman, I think that we this is one area where I do believe women, you know, um, we struggle more than men. Perhaps I'm not. I think we're ashamed. saying all men, yeah, but I think we feel guilty, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, because absolutely. I can be at all my kids. Right. Uh, games. I can't drive to Glendale in the middle of the day, right, to to take my daughter on her softball game. So I have to to have a village that supports me of other moms and other families and other. We don't have our own families here in town. So really relying on on the relationships that you build and, and, and feel okay with that. Right, and knowing that your kids are safe, knowing that they're with people who love them, even if it's not you, and being okay with that because you are building for the future. You're building, you know, you're you're showing them the example that it is possible to work and be a mom. That it is possible to to work and still be present for them and the things that they need. So it's it's. It, it's my <laughs> my daily practice and uh, you know some days I feel better than others I'll be honest like some days I feel terribly guilty because mm -hmm. I can't be in two places at the same time I don't think my husband feels as guilty as I do like he, he truly is okay just you know being present when he can but not not being at every step uh, present for every step of the way I, I tend to internalize that some more you know, I, so I have a, a beautiful daughter, so I have an and 14 year old. It's challenging going on 30. So, <laughs> I know I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, but they, uh, I, I didn't have a supportive um, spouse in my throughout my career. And, and it's interesting because he's in the fire service too. But as I progressed through, he didn't. And it was a matter of, it's a, thing in his mind that eventually make him more money than women. Mm -hmm. And and while he appreciated the fact that I had more money, that I was bringing in more money, it was still a mental thing. Mm -hmm. And and it was still a mental thing for him that, you know, he grew up and his mom was a stay-at-home mom. And and so that it was the, the the mom's role to, you know, really take care of the kids too and and everything. So and the house and all that. And so I learned to multitask and balance and, and do all that for, for a long time until I decided I needed a new, you know, environment, I guess, put it that way. Um, but, but through that time, I understand that in my career, we do a lot of shift work and it's every time away. And as I progressed through, one of the things that was important for me is for consistency for my girls was that I could be there for them when they needed it as well as do my job. So it was advantageous and important for me to go into a staff position, even as a captain, even in continuing through the time. 
because I can still do the things that I want to do um, and have the same effect and impacts at, at, at work. And I can be that, that constant for them. And, you know, to, to if they're sick, I can get them. Or if there's a game, I can go to that. But it took me time to get to that place. And, and, it, and it is, it's, there are times I felt, we talk about failing, there are times I felt like a huge failure in some of these areas. But, um, but, it, but it's when you create the, the correct support system around you and if you, you know, provide that, that safety <coughs> feeling, home feeling for your children and, and they can watch that. Yes, they can also be my mom, but they can also be, be pretty amazing in what they do, even though they still don't know what I do. Because, <laughs> you know, because I'm not in a private truck. Like so. <laughs> yeah, well, I know dad does, but I don't really know what you do. What? <laughs> so. That's great. Yeah. Um, I, my, my story would be like a combination of all of them. Um, I think like a lot of women, you know, you hit 30 and that's that pivotal moment, at least in, in the world that I operate in, where your career and your family sort of almost exactly at the same time. Mm -hmm. And what you'll notice, uh, notice is that a lot of women think they can only do one or the other. And, and it's fair. I mean, not, not all of us shouldn't be doing it all. I'm like a big supporter of that. And um, I think for me, I was pregnant with, with my sons back to back. They're seven and eight going on 20 and 25. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, as I went through two back to back pregnancies, my career was soaring. I took bigger challenges. I got more opportunities. And I remember showing up with a very large belly in, in places where it would be very awkward for people, like, are you going to have a baby now? I mean, I was, <laughs> I was asked that question a lot. Um, and I'm like, no, I'm like solid two weeks away. And it's funny because my son was born two weeks before his due date. <laughs> so I got a lot of calls from work saying, wow, so glad. <laughs> so glad you didn't come in today. Um, but, you know, as, as, as that opportunity came through, I realized, like, at this point, is either this is going to show me what I'm made of or it's gonna show me what I can't do, right? Either way, I mean, just pushing through it is one way. I will know in my circumstances, and I'm very much like you, Julie, where I don't have a direct, you know, family here to support me, but I have, you know, a very strong village that I leverage without any hesitation, like a text, I really need help. And, you know, they're there to help me. And they are my family that I, I choose. Um, so I think as, as you think about my, my children growing up through those ages and my career growing up, I feel like they supported each other. You know, the examples I learned from motherhood where I was, you know, in meetings, putting a baby to bed at night, I run a global team. So I'm usually in night meetings, early morning meetings, all, all day meetings. And I just got comfortable knowing that I could be at home, put the menu warm to bed and still dial into a meeting because my career drives me and my passions, my children. So I didn't want to give up on either one. I also was very afraid of failing at either. But I took the chance to try and see what is it that I can do. And I think what ended up happening is they supported each other. There were times where I would prioritize work. And there were times where nothing will take me away from my goals. And knowing when that priority happens, giving yourself the permission to say, I'd love to go on this field trip and I'd love to be in your, you know, art masterpiece class that Chandler runs and, and my children always want me to volunteer for it. One, I have no art skills. And <laughs> two, I have great friends who run those classes and I count on them and I leverage them. And I also acknowledge that I'll be missing. But when I'm missing in, in activities and areas where my children meet, you know, I'll, I'll find a way to be there in areas where, you know, I wasn't there in, in the past. Um, I think the other thing I'll say is, you know, we talked about fatherhood and, and motherhood. I like to think of my relationship as a partnership. You know, a very 50-50, I think someone on the panel said, that we have to work the 50% line. Like, I have a lot of respect for my husband and his job and his career. And I also have very high expectations of what it means to be my partner. You know, that 50%, you should be able to feed the children, do laundry, keep everyone alive. <laughs> it, it's yours um, because if you stepped out I'll be able to do all of those you know without a struggle and it doesn't work in perfect harmony all the time we support each other there are times when you know I have to pick up the bulk and, and move forward but having that mutual respect of 
you know, what it means to be a working mother and what it means to be a working father, because they both struggle. It's like hard to imagine that, you know, men don't struggle with fatherhood and the responsibilities and the stress that comes with it as the same way as women do. Though I do agree with Julia, we carry an extended amount of bomb guilt. <laughs> it, shows up, it shows up, you know, everywhere you go, but I'm raising two, two boys. And as a feminist, you can spend any amount of time with them. You will see what it means to have a working mother. They're independent. They have like a tremendous sense of, you know, equality and who can they go to ask what questions. They also very proudly, you know, brag about all the amazing things I do, which is frankly the only reason why I do anything now. So I can just wait for a moment and hear them brag about, you know, how awesome their, their mom is. So at some point it starts connecting and, you yeah. know, diaper changes go away and they become these, you know, little men. And then it just all comes together beautifully. In that moment, you enjoy it before it just crashes and burns. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, first of all, let me say, uh, you know, this is uh, Women's Month and uh, happy Women's Month. And I see the women are truly taking the realm and making us very proud. Uh, this, one, uh, this is one of the best session I think I've ever attended uh, to diversity and equity inclusion roundtables. Uh, I really applaud the chamber for putting this group of women together here. In the area of equal work, equal pay, mm -hmm. let's talk and navigate uh, that moment uh, as a woman myself in a, in, a, in a position in an area where uh, men pretty much are dominating um, that area. I knew uh, I went through all these things that you guys have just spoken of. I see every single one of your lives in my life that I have lived. And uh, to the point where um, living here today, it will be like I'm taking all of you with me <laughs> because that's how I can only continue doing what I do. Um, when, you, when you know that you put the work in, when you know that you, you're capable, when you know that you have overcome all these failures and now you have to fight for you to get paid for the work that you know you're putting in that is much higher than anybody else in the room, how do you proceed? How do you get that across to those who are holding that check in the pen? I really think it's about, um, first of all, choosing who you work for, right? Um, and also being able to build the relationships. And I talked about it earlier is having that grace. If you're coming out very aggressively, it's and you get called aggressive even if you just are being direct, let's say that. Um, but being able to have the conversations, to not be afraid to talk about it. As women, sometimes we shy away from consultation or what we feel like consultation. But it's really being prepared to say, hey, um, this is what I've done this year. I hope to see this and this is my expectations and being able to not be afraid to have those conversations. And then working with the HR teams or different areas, but again, going back to where you work, if you know it's a place that really welcomes that type of diversity and equity, then you probably are better off. But I think anytime you can coach and help and talk, don't be afraid. Yeah, like I will add to that. that um, I think the sometimes you know you feel like you're fighting for a cause, and that's exactly what it is to me. And I will tell anyone who will listen to me, you know, don't walk away from a conversation because it's awkward or difficult. Because it's, you're not just speaking for yourself; you're speaking for all of womankind. I mean, imagine carrying that weight around. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you're you're talking about equity and, and equality and and equal pay, it's the same thing. Maybe you don't think it's going to make a difference, but you can't walk away from it. You have to take the opportunity. If it's happening to someone to raise your voice and, and to express your concern and, and yes, aggressive is the term, but really stand up for it. And just remember that we wouldn't all be here if it wasn't for all the women that came before us who took that stance. So I take like a lot of, like it's it's like a weight I carry on my shoulders, you know, from my, my mom, my grandmother and, and all the invisible warriors that have allowed us to be here. And I wanna be one of those invisible warriors for people that come after me. Because uh, uh, you know, if I choose not to share my, my voice or not to raise a flag, I'm choosing to be quiet mm -hmm. and I'm complacent in the behavior. Yes. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. So this actually slides right in. My question is, um, can you give us some examples of what you've done to blaze that trail for women of color, trans women, lesbians that are 
um, just as marginalized in this space and fighting not only racism, um, and gender, and all kinds of other stuff. So I can I can start with that. So in my organization, we we do attract a lot of diverse people from all different walks of life and minorities, specifically in the LGBTQIA uh, community, because I believe like we created a vision for our organization that is founded in equity, right? I think that's seeing diversity as 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 a vision, as a mission for your business. I think it works a lot better than trying to, to address those situations later on. So really working on the foundational aspects of your organizations on your businesses, I think can support uh, a plethora of communities, right? Particularly the, the minorities and more marginalized communities out there. So I work really hard to build equity into everything we do, right? So every time we're on the table, uh, we need to be looking around and seeing like, are these communities represented in this discussion, right? Because we also, uh, a big part of the communities we serve are also, you know, those minorities that are marginalized. So for them to feel safe, they need to be operating from the same place where they're coming from. So, so building foundationally on equity and diversity and representation from those communities for my business has been has been uh, critical and I think has been what truly you know what truly uh, resonates with those communities is the fact that you know we built this into our vision into our mission to be accepting and to be you know to have representation from all of those communities when you look at our vision is to change lives right so we're not just talking about changing lives of this group of people and that group of people want to change lives and change minds and come show how they they come together in our community. So I think that looking at diversity as a vision, as a mission statement, can can help businesses uh, reach a lot of those communities. And, and Jennifer, if I can add to that great question, by the way, I, I think you know I think of the journey we've made and the progress we've made in women's rights and equality to get where we are. It's farther ahead, and I think the road for you know women of color, the road for our LGBTQ community, is even harder because they're dealing with this intersectionality. Is this concept that you know at one point you're not just a woman, you're a woman who's also a woman of color, who is an immigrant. It's this intersectionality that makes it so complex to navigate. And I think one of the things of all the, the I think across the table, you know, we work in, in communities and with teams that are diverse and value equity. What I would like to see more is that journey, those voices of, you know, uh, women of color, those voices of marginalized communities actually showcased more because they are coming from a very different, uh, you know, perspective that perhaps some of them, some of us don't. And the more we get those stories heard, the more we're normalizing, you know, having them on the table and their stories heard. So I think we need to do more of that when we look at our communities and, and where we are today. I have one too that I just want to real quick. So the biggest thing that any of us can do, and I would challenge everyone in this room, is to be self-reflective. All of us have biases. All of us do. It's not just men, it's everybody. So I was listening to a podcast where we're talking about a white and a black woman looked in the mirror. What do you see? I see a woman. And the black woman said, I see a black woman. The fact that you just see a woman is your privilege. It's an invisible something that you have that no one else has. It's being able to say, okay, I, I do have biases. I was raised a certain way. I work with Donna. If I've got questions that I need to ask her about like her heritage, I will ask her. It's being curious and going to the people and saying, hey, tell me, how does this work? How does this make you feel? How can I do better? And really being that partnership. A lot of time women, there's this women on women crime mm. and it needs to stop. Like it, that's the biggest thing I can say in here is like, we should be there, like we all talk about our villages, and that's what makes us successful is us to really like, okay, I can change me, I can change how I think, I can change how I perceive, because if we're going to have a bias when we need so we've got to get rid of it, and that's up to us. So we have a question, thank you so much, uh, from the web, let's take it. Yes, it's from uh, Ashu with Intel, um, so she asks, what, if any, is the biggest positive change in mindsets have you seen that supports us, us being women, um, breaking the bias? So let me repeat the question, what is the biggest mindset change we've seen 
that helps women breaking the device. Maybe take like a 30 second answer. Having, having allies, allies, having leadership show up to women, it, you know, training, having the village, um, just being able to stop yourself and say, yeah, I may have a bias too, and how can I do better? The shift. The shift towards empathy, right? Yeah. So towards putting yourself in the shoes of others and seeing things from others' perspectives. I think this is something I've been seeing um, happen in our industry and in our communities. And I think it's a positive change, but of course we have a long way to go still. No, I, I can't do anything more than echo what <laughs> this said. So it's, and I would probably add to that, that opportunities. I think one of the biggest mind shift in being trailblazers isn't that trailblazers didn't exist in the 1900s. They just didn't have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, and today, we have that tremendous privilege of having the opportunity to trailblaze. And we have a voice because we have social media. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. We are at, uh, at time. It was a privilege to be on this amazing panel. Thank you so much for sharing your inspiring and wonderful stories. They will stay with me and, and our audience for a very long time to come. Thank you for all who joined us in the room physically and uh, thanks for joining us um, on, online. I wanna thank um, our sponsors, um, Intel, PayPal, Toyota Services, Edward Jones, Salt River Projects and Wells Fargo. Um, you will be receiving a survey. The team would love to know how this went. If you'd like to like share your thoughts, we are super excited and eager to hear from you. Thank you so much and have a fantastic day.